Um, all right. Uh, welcome out, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, actually tonight, before we get started, I'm going to mention this at the beginning rather than the end, because I know uh, this, these things can get lost. Uh, I just want to announce real quick that I'm offering a 10-week course in Buddhism starting next month, uh, starting on March 8th. Uh, it's a 10-week session on the basics of Buddhism. So basically, it's kind of like a very intense vocabulary lesson on ideas like, uh, you know, three poisons, four noble truths, five skandhas, six senses, all the basics. Um, and so it's good if you're just beginning, but it's also good if you really know your dharma because it goes much deeper. So if you're interested in that, you can go to my, uh, my website, lotusunderground.com and find out more there. Otherwise, we're back. Um, thanks, Noam, for putting the, the links there. Um, okay, so tonight, as usual, we have a theme. And tonight's theme is the family of the Buddhas. So this is an idea that you see a lot in Mahayana Buddhism, but it's also really important to Vajrayana Buddhism as well. So that'll be interesting to see some connections later on tonight about that. Um, I'm going to get back to our sutra. So we're reading this beautiful sutra about Manjushri's uh, pure land, basically, Manjushri's Buddha land. The Bodhisattva Manjushri actually got mentioned briefly last week, but then we, well, what happened was before the Buddha could give his, his big uh, Dharma talk, he decided to invite all these bodhisattvas from all of these different regions, all these different Buddha realms. And so the Buddha told us, or actually I should say the sutra, the sutra told us that the Buddha emitted this light from his body that then went in all these different directions. And then bodhisattvas in Buddha lands in these various directions, saw this light, heard the Buddha's clear voice, and all decided to come here to the Saha world, to this world endurance or enduring. So we went to three Buddha lands, uh, starting in the east, and then in the south, and then in the west. And tonight we're gonna visit the Buddha land in the north, it's an equally beautiful section like the other ones were, so I'm really looking forward to reading it. But before we can do that, we need, we, we need to be in the right, right frame of mind. And I mean that kind of two ways. One, a sutra like this, it's unfortunate to have to break for a week. <laughs> you know, you get a momentum, you're going to all these places and you kind of just get into a frame of mind. And so I want to lead us back to that frame of mind so that when we go to the North and we go to see this other Buddha land, we're kind of ready. So I mean it that way, but I also mean it another way where that I have to prepare us because I mentioned last week that there was a first, there is, I read the first part of the sutra that takes place in the city, right? In Rajgriha. Then the Buddha goes back to this mysterious vulture's peak. And it's there that he's inviting all these bodhisattvas from all over to give this special Dharma talk. And what I said last week was the vulture's peak is this like special place where the Buddha gives like the deep Dharma teachings. And at, I think even at the point where I'll, where I'll get to tonight, the sutra even says, this is a special teaching just for bodhisattvas. So I need to kind of get us in that bodhisattva frame of mind so that we can read this because it's a little delicate tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm warning you, it's a little tricky, this idea of the family of the Buddhas. So to, to bring us up to speed, 
we need to have this kind of talk. So the theme, the other theme tonight, it's sort of a subject tonight, not the theme, but a subject. We're going to be talking about those famous or perhaps infamous 32 auspicious marks, otherwise called the 32 characteristics, the 32 auspicious characteristics, the 32 lakshana. So these are this idea of these 32 distinguishing characteristics by which you could identify or kind of, yeah, identify a fully enlightened Buddha. We're gonna be talking about these 32 characteristics. But before we can do that and go to the Buddha land where we're gonna hear about that, let's talk about characteristics. We talk about this almost every Sunday night, I know, and I'm going to even use an example I use almost every Sunday night, but it's just one of those things where, where we need to take these steps to think a certain way. So in terms of characteristics, and because we're going to be talking about the 32 characteristics, we need to talk about bodily characteristics, physical characteristics. I could, you know, choose different dharmas, different ideas here, and talk about the characteristics of phenomena, characteristics of different, of different things. Tonight, though, we're going to focus on bodily characteristics. And I'm going to begin where I always begin. It's the question of Am I tall? Like, am I a tall person? And the idea is, is that, let me set up a scenario for you. If we were over here and we were in a room and I was towering <laughs> over everybody else, everybody, and I'm like patting everybody on the head because I'm towering over them. The answer to the question might be, yeah, you are tall. But then I go to this other room that's full of basketball players, NBA basketball players, and I am the shortest person and they're patting me on the head. All of a sudden I'm short. But wait a minute, I thought I was tall. I'm going to go back in the other room because I, I like being tall. So the idea is, is that if we just focus for a moment on that idea, is Michael tall or short we can really quickly come to the understanding that it depends <laughs> it depends <laughs> and in buddhism when we say that something depends we would say that it's conditional it's based upon the conditions in this room the conditions are such that I am tall. But in this room, the conditions are such that I'm short. So my height is conditional. It's samskrita, as they would say. Let's take another one. Am I smart? Again, if I'm over in this room, and I'm giving a lecture and I'm da 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 da, and people are, you know, listening to what I have to say. It should sir seem like you're smart. Then I go in this other room and I'm like, it's some other information. I don't even understand the language that's coming out of these people's mouths, right? Some kind of math conference or something. All of a sudden, I'm not so smart. Oh, it depends, <laughs> it's conditional. Am I in the room with really, really smart people in which I'm not very smart? Or am I in the room with another smart people? I don't know. And I'm so smartness is now relative and conditional. On those, let me just remind you of this. I, I need to remind you of this too. Regarding my tallness or shortness, the thing about characteristics is that I kind of jumped to their, their conditionality and I missed the part 
where how we forget <laughs> that they are conditional. And when we miss that, we attribute the, that characteristic, we attribute it to the person in, in, the, in the way that you might say that I'm tall and as if Michael possesses that characteristic and quality. By, we could also do not tall and short, but big and small. Am I a big guy? That depends as well, right? Because if it's a bunch of toddlers, I'm the biggest person in the room. But if I get in the room with a, uh, you know, a wrestler, a sumo wrestler, all of a sudden I'm looking pretty skinny in that sense. So am I a big person? Wow, it depends. Am I tall? Am I smart? The idea is, is that all of these characteristics are conditional and relative, and they only appear to be characteristics or qualities of this in that way. Let me do another one too. This will be kind of a little significant for where this is going tonight. So one idea would be that I'm Californian. So that's another characteristic. Now you might pick up on that by the way I speak, certain uh, 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 language things that give it away, you know, whatever it is, or you might just, you know, check my uh, identification. I got a, a California driver's license, right? So I'm Californian. But what's interesting about that is, of course, what does it mean to be a Californian? Does it mean to be born here? What if you immigrate and you just reside here? What if you're actually just in California right now? You know? something interesting, you know, you might not know about like Japanese culture. Japanese culture is pretty hardcore when it comes to who's Japanese or not. In Japan, it's much more than just being born in Japan. There's levels to being Japanese that go back generations. And it's somewhere around five generations where you can really call yourself Japanese. So it's not even about you being born in Japan, your parents being born in Japan, or your parents' parents being born in Japan to be really Japanese. But once again, who is to say in that regard? The person who goes back five generations, the person that only was born there, the person that emigrated, or the person who's just currently in Japan, currently in California. The point is, is that you might want to say that something like being Californian is just built, it's built in. <laughs> like, okay, Michael, you got me on the tallness, you got me on the big and sh short, but being a Californian is just sort of like, like you kind of either are or you aren't, right? Or does it depend again? And so once again, I could claim to be a Californian, but then somebody whose family goes back many generations on this land might be looking at me and saying, you're not a Californian, you're a European. You're of European descent, white boy. You're from that land. So it depends. It depends on how I think of myself in that regard, how others think of me. But the point is, is I can think of myself as tall. Am I? I could think of myself as smart. Am I? These are definitely rhetorical questions in, in, that, in that sense. So let's go a little further. So because of the topic tonight, I want to talk about some other characteristics that will be relevant. And those are the characteristics that, because of certain other characteristics, I don't know hairiness in that way or whatever, you might think I'm male. And that's another one of those things that it would really seem as if that was not, that it was, a, what, what would be the word? Inalienable. So we have this great word in English, inalienable, unseparatable. <laughs> so we would think that my maleness in that sense is just, just you know, now I know 
especially in the 21st century, we are very wise to know that these things are not <laughs> like that. But for the general audience there that might not have gotten the memo about those things, the idea is, is that, and this is, I wanted to choose, or again, because of where the suture is going, I wanted to talk about the idea of being perceived as a tall California, male Californian, right? Or, a, you know, whatever the, some other characteristics might be. But when we get to talking about maleness, what's interesting about being conceived of or thought of as male or female in that sense is that actually each of those, male and female, are actually kind of a assortment of characteristics, right? Because it's sort of about, oh, if you have a deep voice and you're hairy and you have these other physical characteristics and you have this characteristic and that character well wait a minute <laughs> which are the essential ones here to being you know a male or a female do you have to have long hair to be a female i have long hair the idea here is is that a concept or an idea a a demarcator like male or female those again are these kind of like a, a mass, they're masses of characteristics, if you know what I mean, that, it, that we make the determination that somebody would be male or female, not just on the length of their hair, not just on the tone of their voice, not just on the hairiness of their face, not just on this, not just on that, not, but it's an assortment that we would eventually sort of say, you know what, in my conditioned mind, you're looking pretty male in that sense, or you're looking pretty female in that sense. But here's the thing about it. Each of those being hairy, well, it depends. It's relative. A deep voice, well, it depends. That's relative. All of these individual characteristics that we would then put together into a pile and say, oh, that's a male person. Each of those characteristics are equally relative and not actually owned and possessed by the person that we think we're, they're owned and possessed by. They just like, and I, I saved this one for last, just like the idea of beauty and ugliness. Is, is this screen beautiful? It doesn't actually even matter if it's next to an uglier screen, because it will be in the eye of the beholder whether it's beautiful. It will be in the eye of the beholder whether I'm tall. It will be in the eye of the beholder whether I am male. And it is in the eye of this beholder that I do consider myself male. I was conditioned that way. I fit all the markers and I have filled out so many of those forms where I have to check the box that I've been conditioned to think that. But what I'm getting at is, is that the, the feeling that we have about ourselves is one thing and the feeling others have about us are kind of other things and the two don't have to match up at all. So is everybody following me on this sort of because I'm kind of laying a little breadcrumb trail of ideas. So now let's play a really interesting game. This is, and you could do it, you could do it over here, looking at me. You could do it looking down, looking at yourself. You could do it uh, looking at someone across the room. But given everything that we just talked about regarding tall and short, big and, and skinny, whatever, smart, ugly, beautiful, all of these different things, right? If we really understand everything kind of I just said, in particular, the two things, all of these characteristics are conditional and relative and therefore have no actual fixity and they're not actually owned or possessed by the thing or the person we think they are. So let's walk through an interesting little thought experiment. If I'm not inherently tall, 
or short? How big am I? Well, maybe since we understand the relative conditional nature of the, that idea of tallness, and since it's not owned or possessed by me anyways, we can actually take that characteristic and <laughs> throw it away, empty it out, so to speak, be wise and recognize it's not here. If you think I'm tall, you didn't hear what I was talking about. The idea is I'm not tall. And even if you thought I was tall, I would just have to go in another room and all of a sudden you would realize I'm not tall. So the tallness isn't here. And so what I'm getting at is, is what happens when that characteristic of tallness becomes empty? And remember, we, we have emptied it out wisely. We understand that it is totally relative and not over here or over there. It's kind of in a weird, never in between space. So if I'm not tall or short and I'm not smart or stupid, if I'm not Californian nor not Californian in that way, because what I'm getting at is, is that if I'm not Californian, like inherently in that way, what am I? You, you know, uh, uh, oh, I'm a, uh, what are they, what do we call them? Earthling. Oh, that's, an, that's relative again, isn't it? That's one of those other relative things that's relative to Earth, relative to Mars. So if you keep going with me on this, and again, you can do it towards yourself, and then you get to these deeper ones, like the idea of being or identifying as male or female and realizing that those are not really like that. What I'm getting at is, is that what happens when you wisely, through the understanding of emptiness and all that, actually remove all of human. Human is relative to animal, vegetable, and mineral. So not human, not male, not smart, not stupid, not tall, not this, not that. If, if you're following along, right, you, you might be wondering then what, what am I <laughs> it, it, free of all of that? And you might be thinking of it, asking that of me, or you might be asking it of yourself which is to say you're doing the exercise I'm encouraging you to do and then asking yourself, well, what am I then? What is this then? Everybody with me. Next up. So I wanna just put that, the characteristics, all characteristics are kind of empty in that way. Let's just put that right over here for a second. We're going to come back to it immediately, but we I want to talk about one other idea. An idea that's also relative to the sutra, relative to this idea that's right over there, the emptiness of characteristics. I want to talk about identity. So this is about, and I've, I've already kind of hinted at it, but now this is about the idea of identifying as Californian. So no longer being perceived as that, but identifying as that. And when I say identify, I mean, I am a Californian, like owning that as an identity, as part of your identity. So, one Dharma talk that I give a lot is about the nature of the bodhisattva, this creature, this sattva, because remember, sattva means a, a, a creature, a being, but not just any creature or being, a creature or a being of bodhi, of awakening, of enlightenment, a bodhisattva. So one of the Dharma talks I give to try to kind of articulate or explain what, what is a bodhisattva? Well, the, in terms of the construction of identity, 
construction of the notion of a self, there are many different aspects to a self. I'm going to mention some. These are not requisites to a self, of course, but they're part of many identities. So one, of course, is this idea of identifying with a body, which is to say that I, Michael, for example, identify with this physical body. And if you, if, if somebody threw something at my little bird friend here, or somebody made fun of my little bird friend here, or whatever, I wouldn't take it personally, <laughs> because I don't identify with that uh, space. I don't, I'm, 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 over, I'm over here <laughs> identifying with this. So we can identify with the body, but in terms of the construction of identity, we could identify with something like a job or occupation. Hi, I'm a teacher, I'm an architect, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm what have you. So we can identify with that. We can identify with a marital status in that way, being married or not, being single in that sense. We could identify with our family, which is to say our last name. I am Michael Owens of the Owens kind of family clan in that way. So there's all these different things that I could identify with. And again, this would be like, hi, I'm Michael, the teacher from California, <laughs> right? And those are all part of my identity. So the way that I like to describe the Bodhisattva path is a simple one to begin with, is identifying with your occupation. So here's kind of the, the, the dukkha problem, the sort of like the problem with identifying with your occupation. The idea is, is like, let's say I identified with being an architect and I get, I go to school because I identify, I wanna be an architect. I get my degree, it's official. I'm an architect. I get a job, I'm an architect. But then something happens and I lose my job as an architect. And I can't find a job as an architect. There's a way in which because I have been identifying, like that's who I am. There's a way in which when I lose that position, I lose my identity. And there's dukkha that can arise from that attachment to identity that way. Likewise, I could identify as a husband. And then if that changes, go through a divorce or something like that, I could suffer because of identifying as a husband. And when that's challenged and that's removed, I, there's an actual existential crisis where my identity is now shook. So the thing about it is, is that from the Buddhist point of view here, these identifications they're problematic and tricky for a few reasons. One is the basic reason I just gave you, which is that if we're too attached and committed to that identity, we put ourselves at risk in that sense because that can be taken away in that way. So that's the first part of the identity problem is that you could get fired or whatever, whatever. But there's kind of a deeper problem with it, which is that pile of empty characteristics we just got done talking about. Which is that if I'm identifying with that, I'm actually identifying with one, like a, it's empty. I'm not, I'm never actually an architect. I could think of myself that way and I could think others are, or hope others are thinking me, of me that way. But the first lesson I gave about the emptiness of characteristics is to point out how if we're attached to those things as that, we're attached to kind of fictions in a way, in that sense, relative, conditional, dependent fictions. So that being the case, it's like this. I could go from identifying as a husband 
But then if something happens and I go through a divorce, well, I better get busy identifying as a single person. <laughs> Likewise with my job, I better get busy identifying with being, you know, unemployed. But here's the thing. We could do that, which is, oh, we identified with this over here. Let me go identify with this over here. We could do that. Or as I explain it, as I understand it, what it means to be on the bodhisattva path, part of the bodhisattva is not identifying. And that's a very subtle, powerful place to be in of not actually identifying with anything. And what I mean by powerful is that if you're not identified with your occupation and you get fired, you weren't locked into that as your identity. So the transition to some new thing to do is going to be a lot easier if you weren't hung up on that. Likewise, all of these different things that we become sort of clinging and attached to, a big part, if, if not the entirety of the Bodhisattva path is just about not replacing this with that, but actually doing a third move, so to speak, of not identifying. Tanya. Yeah, I mean, so would you say that like basically a bodhisattva is just like super good at just seeing the emptiness and everything um, and like things still arise. It's not that they're not there. It's just that the bodhisattva recognizes pretty much in everything the um, insubstantial and constructed nature of it from our concept concepts. And then like, would you say like, does no, but does a bodhisattva like sort of, do they still have like a relative self and then like their absolute self, you know? Cause I've heard people talk about how, hmm. you know, the, the, um, the self as a construct is useful, right? In your daily life, but you can still have it being useful in your daily life and yet see it as empty, you know, as just a construct um, so that you hold everything lightly. So does the, do you think the Bodhisattva does something like that too? Well, I can only speak for myself in that sense, but I will tell you that holding it gently idea, I would say that's what I mean by being an architect, but not identifying as an architect. That's the holding it gently. The, it's the clinging. It's a very important point. It's actually very important. Because the idea is, is that there's sort of, well, yeah, I don't want to say too much because I want to get to the suture. I want to talk about this, but I was just going to say that it, it has to do with that idea of if you don't identify with this, there is going to be a temptation then to identify as that or with that. And the holding it gently is actually not doing that. Now, I want to remind you, too, of another, um, is that good, Tanya? You feel? Yeah, yeah, seriously, so, so it's essentially just like holding nothing. Well, it's more, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm saying if you're a bodhisattva, like you're of just course. really like, you know. The thing that I want to get across, and it's the kind of the, it's sort of the reason I structured this talk the way I did, like to kind of gently move us towards this idea is because I really want to focus on how the bodhisattva doesn't identify with these things out of wisdom, not out of like repression or a oh, kind yeah. of self-control in that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's all wisdom. It's like you just like you, it's not repression. It's not like it's empty nihilism, not there. It's like, it's like, you um, know, there's still this phenomena happening, right? And it's just well, that you know you notice it, but you you understand that they're empty. There's no inherent lakshana. There's no inherent characteristics. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That, exactly. that kind of you you yeah. yeah you know this time you got it you got it totally. 
Yeah. Oh. I also just came off of a retreat this week on emptiness. So there you go. <laughs> so right. I'm like, man. <laughs> and it's why I kind of wanted to, to do this slowly because I know everybody hasn't just come off of a meditation retreat on emptiness. <laughs> but great, great question. Yes. Sorry. It's just like, <laughs> no, no. Anyway, Everybody thanks, else Michael. feeling okay about what's what we're talking about, what's going on? Okay, so that brings me to sort of the theme of tonight and now to the sutra. So I kind of dangled it out there, um, but I didn't say much about it. And that was the one about identifying with one's family, which is to say that I, you know, again, speaking only for myself, I think of myself as the child of my parents, not yours. <laughs> I do not identify as your parents' child. I identify as those two people's child in that way. So that's part of my identity. It's something that is a tricky one that I, I wanna talk about, again, because of where this is going. So you may already know, we kind of talked about it a little bit last week but or maybe even it was two weeks ago so this sutra two weeks ago we dealt with the idea of what is called either going forth or leaving home and that's the basic buddhist nomenclature for renunciation for going and joining a monastery and becoming a monastic, either a nun or a monk or what have you. But the, the, the nomenclature in Buddhism is about leaving home. And you may know, but you may not know, that traditionally, traditionally, when someone leaves home and goes forth and becomes a monastic in the Buddhist tradition, they sever ties with their family they do traditionally this is done kind of literally where you you really don't talk to them much but more symbolically and significantly you give up your name and you get a dharma name as a monastic and that is you're now you're in the family of the buddhas just to let you know where this is headed in that way you're in the family of the Buddhas now, so you actually get a new surname. And which is interesting, you know, in, you might not know this and you might find it interesting. Throughout all of, well, I could, shouldn't say all of it, but you know what I mean, for the majority of Chinese Buddhism today and forever, all the different schools, all the different sects, all monastics, you know, in, in Chinese names are three characters, the family name, like Li, and then a personal name, Li De Yu, or, you know, uh, Ming Zhao Zi. So you get a family name, two characters that are your personal name. In Asian countries, Japan included, when people go forth and renounce, they get a new name and the first character of that name is shi and then it's shi something something and the shi is from the chinese word shi jia mo ni or shakya muni so you literally take on this character as your family name which is the name shakya muni which is the shakya muni family so that's a sim again a symbolic gesture of this severing ties with the family and kind of taking on a new family. Pretty standard for renunciation in most traditions. Uh, a lot of traditions where you renounce, you sever ties with your family and you take on a new name as a symbol of that. Um, in Buddhism, it even goes a little further where they do this whole uh, shaving your head baptismal thing, where you kind of get literally reborn and renamed in this whole thing. So a little thing about that. But that's all the Hinayana. That's all the early school where you actually left home and like literally went and became a monastic. And what I'm saying is, or what I'm alluding to, is that two weeks ago, we learned it was the Buddha's first Dharma talk in the Sutra. And he explained 
to a bodhisattva that if I were to just summarize it, understanding the emptiness of your house, that's leaving home. Understanding the emptiness of all phenomena, like really, really understanding that, that's leaving home. That's going forth. So that was the lesson two weeks ago. That was like the main focus of the Dharma talk the Buddha gave the first time. And I bring it up because it's significant to the theme tonight. So there's been a reworking of what it means to go forth and leave home in the Mahayana. And it's what allows, and not just allows, I kind of want to like knock that way of thinking even out of myself because it's really profound that the Mahayana says, you know, you don't have to like go live in a cave <laughs> to get enlightened. If you understand the emptiness of your own house in that way and are not attached to it in that way, that's leaving home. And this is where you get householder bodhisattvas. And it's not a, uh, uh, a cop-out. It's not a like, oh, you couldn't handle it without the real people out in the forest. You got to it's like, no, actually, you can't handle it in the city, which is part of where this sutra is going, by the way. So, okay, so we already learned about that. And so tonight, what we're about to get is in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, what does it mean to become part of the family of the Buddhas, part of this new family? So Tonight's theme in that sense is about this kind of Buddhist sense of rebirth, but what exactly that means. So on that note, I think I'm ready to do the sutra. Everybody good? Feeling good? Yeah, Tanya. So when you said rebirth, is you're not you're not talking reincarnation, are you? You're mm. talking re rebirth good into catch. the family. Into good the catch. family? I am not talking about reincarnation, rebirth. I'm, yeah, I'm talking about being born into a new family, okay. which is Thanks. the family of the Buddhas. Yeah. Okay, so let me just get this out of the way. <laughs> so here's the deal. We all know where we're at, right? The light, the voice, and then also at that moment, in a Buddha realm called eternally decorated, which is located to the north, past Buddha realms numbering 63 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River, there was a Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambuddha named King of All Shala Trees, who is still present alive and well and teaching the Dharma. There were no white clad householders in that Buddha realm for it was populated exclusively with saffron clad bodhisattvas. There were also no women, nor was the word womb ever heard of. The bodhisattvas there were born miraculously clad in their saffron robes, sitting cross-legged on lotus flowers. That blessed one, Tathagata, was giving the Dharma teaching there, known as the seal of the Buddha family to all the bodhisattvas. Okay, so I wanna address something that you heard. In this Buddha land to the north, it says there were no women, nor was the word womb even heard of. This is something that you find every now and then, which is this idea that in certain Buddha lands, there's no women. And I gotta tell you, for the longest time, that idea bothered me. It doesn't sound right. It sounds like, well, wait, what are we talking about? What are we doing? And so, when I chose this sutra, I didn't exactly remember that there was one of those moments in this. And so getting ready for tonight, I was like, oh, this is one of those ones where they're gonna talk about the Buddha, uh, Buddha land with no women. But then looking at it deeper and going and checking on the Chinese just to make sure I've got all the information I have, 
something very conspicuous pops out. And it actually, because of this sutra, I have come to a better understanding of what those other sutras mean when they talk about there being no women. They really should say, and no men. <laughs> like they really should. It doesn't, and there's a way in which they're just kind of don't have the courage, I think, in a way to do that. I'll say more about that in a second, but let me go back. When you read, especially the Chinese, and I got to tell you, the Chinese version of this sutra and the Chinese version of most sutras for, is far more gender neutral. It's why I prefer translating from Chinese than the Sanskrit. They're more, it, the, the Chinese language, first of all, allows for much more discourse that's gender neutral, where you can just talk generally without having to specify. But then you get to a situation like this where they have specified. And, you know, I don't read Tibetan, so, but I did my best at trying to identify the key words in the Tibetan version. And what keeps sticking out in all of the different versions is it's not so much about women per se, as it is about wombs. It's why there's that line that says about how the word womb wasn't even heard of. Now, the reason why they're talking about this is because these bodhisattvas in that Buddha land are miraculously born on lotus flowers. <laughs> There's, there, I was saying, I was saying earlier to somebody getting ready for this, this sutra, it really should say, and in that Buddha land, there were no maternity wards. It's what it wants to say. It doesn't, I, my feeling about it is that it doesn't actually want to say there were no women. In fact, the, in the Chinese, it's very, it, it goes to lengths to say there wasn't the category woman or the word womb or whatever. So again, in my estimation, they're just really trying to focus on the idea of in that Buddha land, birth doesn't happen the way it does in other, most other places. These bodhisattvas are born instantly on, on lotus flowers, already clad in monastic robes. So my feeling of going forward in terms of pure lands without women, it's about without the vaginal birth, basically, in that way. Now, unfortunately, these lines allow for Buddhism to go in directions that I don't approve of, and it, unfortunately, it goes there. So hopefully, I can set the record straight a little bit and you know, move it in a different direction. So everybody OK with that going forward? No. Um, I, I like that charitable, slightly more charitable interpretation. I hope it's doing my best. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you You always trying to make sure that we're careful with how we uh, talk about gender, but I'm wondering what the significance of that is, if anything, or are you gonna talk about that? Like That's the Dharma talk. That's the Dharma talk. Oh, that's the Dharma talk, okay. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I, I would have just glossed over the line. Yeah. That would have been my great upaya tonight, yeah. would have been just not to read it. Yeah and just moved right along if it weren't actually significant to the suit like the the point so thank you yeah 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 and it's a be beautiful beautiful sutra um in fact no because of what because of the things that i want to say going forward let me just clarify it's actually why i started tonight the way i did in the specific way that I did to lead to this idea that bodhisattvas are in the business of not identifying. And I'm talking across the board, you know, not identifying with a political party, not identifying with even a religion, not identifying as bodhisattvas. <laughs> you know, it goes on and on and on. And I wanted to stress that because if you're in a land 
of bodhisattvas who are all in the business of not identifying as male or female or this or that, or da, 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 like that they're all in the business of practicing this non-identification. That's, in a way, that's already understood in the sutra, that that's what a bodhisattva is. And so I wanted to say all of that ahead of time, Noam, to make it clear about like that at least. The deeper meaning will still come from the sutra. Okay, good. So a quick word about this auspicious, he says um, that the Buddha in the North past many, 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 many worlds, the Buddha there was giving a discourse on the Buddha family mudra, or it's called the seal of the family of the Buddhas. It's a, it, this is the teaching he's giving. And, and now I'm reading the sutra, by the way. And what is the seal of the Buddha family, you may ask? It refers to initially developing bodhicitta, right? Developing the mind set on anuttara samyak sambodhi. That's how it begins. And subsequently, the perfecting of all the bodhisattva teachings, engaging with the bodhisattva pitika the bodhisattva basket, studying the main subject of dharanis, those mnemonic devices I've mentioned, being undistracted, practicing giving, pursuing emptiness, accomplishing signlessness, seeking wishlessness, being naturally free from attachment, understanding the five aggregates, the six sense media, six sense bases, sustaining the continuity of one's intended actions, desiring the wisdom of the Buddhas and trusting it, realizing all dharmas, yet not having any concept of a dharma and serving the, severing the continuity of thoughts so that they disappear. These are called the seal of the Buddha family. So, okay, quick few words on the seal of the Buddha family teaching, because I do wanna read the, the rest of it because it's it would have been a waste to say all of this without reading the end of it. Those teachings right there, the idea of like this teaching of the being in the family of the Buddha and having the seal of being in the family of the Buddhas. So it begins with generating the aspiration for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. I did a whole night on that. So that should be understandable. Perfecting the Bodhisattva trainings or the Bodhisattva practices. Those are traditionally understood to be the Paramitas. So engaging with the bodhisattva pitika is an interesting uh, line. There is a large sutra that's part of the Maharatnakuta collection from which this sutra comes. So this is the 15th sutra in this collection that we're reading. The 12th in this collection is called the Bodhisattva Pitika, the Bodhisattva Basket. It appears to be the oldest sutra in this collection, and this might be a reference to that. The Bodhisattva Pitika has not been translated into English, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully that'll happen one day. Studying Dharanis, mnemonic devices. I would love to talk a lot about those, but I'm not, but they are these interesting mnemonic devices of bodhisattvas have a lot to do with kind of lists, understanding certain lists that if you know them, they can unlock other lists in a way. So that's sort of the idea of mnemonics. Being undistracted, 
mindfulness, sati, great. Practicing giving, we know all about that. That's definitely part of the bodhisattva path. Then we get to the three that I wanted to actually speak on. It says that this seal of the family of the Buddhas, it's about bodhisattvas pursuing emptiness, accomplishing signlessness, and seeking wishlessness. So those are called the three doors of liberation. They are these bodhisattva, very Mahayana ideas. Emptiness, I've already spoken at length about at the beginning of tonight. So we were talking about the emptiness of different things because of their conditional relative nature. They are therefore empty in that way. It's funny, and it's meant to be funny, by the way, that it says pursuing emptiness. I say that that's supposed to be funny because the next of these, accomplishing signlessness, is a funny turn of phrase. So signlessness is what I was describing at the opening of the talk. When I was talking about if I'm not tall and I'm not short and I'm not male or female and I'm not this and I'm not that, if I'm not <laughs> any of those, then the idea is, is that if you arrive at, if you arrive at an understanding of what I am, sans characteristics, without characteristics, that's called signlessness, characteristiclessness. Animita is the technical term. So this signlessness is what I was describing. And what I mean is, and you can really just, just work with the tall, short one, because they, they are all functioning like that. And so if you can really understand how I'm neither tall nor short, and actually can rest in a, in a satisfied state of mind, that isn't, it's, it's like fine not having that. That's signless in terms of my height. But if you keep going and keep going to absolute signlessness, that's called the animita. And when it says accomplishing signlessness, it's actually a funny reference to these 32 characteristics that are about to get mentioned. Because the idea is, is that when you transcend through wisdom, the, the dualistic conditional characteristics, and they're all dualistic conditional characteristics. The idea is, is that a being who has transcended all of those exhibits or accomplishes the 32 characteristics. But this is funny because it's saying that the bodhisattva accomplishes signlessness, which is what I was doing my Dharma talk at the beginning of the tonight, that very idea. And then the last of these is the funniest, seeking wishlessness. Wishlessness is the idea of wanting, wanting this to go this way, wanting this, you know, wanting the Bengals to win the Super Bowl. That's a wish, that's a desire. Now, regarding the Super Bowl, I was totally on a pranihita. I was totally wishless this year. I really, I was good on that. I had a lot of other things I was invested in and not, uh, not accomplishing wishlessness so well, but on that one, I got it. My point is, is that the state of actually not having any wishes in that way is this state of a pranihita. And so it's funny to talk about seeking wishlessness. Bodhisattvas are also being naturally free from attachment. I spoke about attachment earlier too, also part of that. And then the Bodhisattva understands the five aggregates the six sense organs and the six sense objects. 
Okay, I'm gonna just end there because I did want to get to the uh, end. So everybody ready for the the fun? So in this Buddha realm that I was just describing, there was also a bodhisattva, a great being named King of the Mound of Stars, adorned with characteristics who had formed the unique aspiration of bodhisattvas aspiring that any being who beheld this bodhisattva mahasattva would become adorned with the 32 marks of a great being the bodhisattva king of the mound of stars adorned with characteristics, also witnessed the great burst of illumination and also heard the clear voice. And so he went before the blessed Tathagata, king of all Shala trees. Arriving there, he bowed his head at the feet of the blessed one, circumambulated him three times and sat to one side. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva, king of the mound of stars adorned with characteristics, then asked the blessed Tathagata, king of all Shala trees, O oh, world honored one, what are the causes and conditions of this great illumination and this booming sound of a clear voice that has manifested in our world? The Tathagata, king of all Shala trees, answered the Bodhisattva saying, in a Buddha realm called Saha, enduring, located to the south, past Buddha realms numbering 63 times the number of grains of sand in the Ganges River, there is a Tathagata Arahat Samyak Sambutta named Shakyamuni, who is still present, alive and well, and teaching the Dharma. The Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambhuta Shakyamuni is gathering bodhisattvas from immeasurably many countless trillions of worlds throughout the ten directions. In order to proclaim the Dharma, all the pores of his body have emitted this light and the sound of his clear voice. The bodhisattva Mahasattva responded, asking, O oh, world honored one, why is that world called Saha, enduring? The world honored one answered saying, because the beings in that world endure in their greedy attachment, endure in their angry aggression, and endure in their deluded ignorance. And endure in their suffering. Therefore, the world is called Saha, enduring. World honored one, the Bodhisattva replied. Is there anyone there who is not engaged in abuse and ridicule, intimidation and violence? Are there any who have dispelled the attitudes of greed, anger and delusion? Noble one, the beings in that world who have such qualities as that are few. Most beings there are malicious, hostile, and aggressive. They're all caught up in greed, anger, and delusion. World honored one, the Bodhisattva replied. This name, Saha, enduring, it doesn't seem appropriate as long as it's possible for those beings to become patient, to have kashanti. Then, world honor one, just because they are so impatient at present, it's not appropriate to call it enduring. Noble one, the Buddha said, in that Buddha realm, there are noble sons and noble daughters who follow the bodhisattva yana, the bodhisattva vehicle, who attend to the buddhas of the past, 
develop their roots of virtue, have served many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas, and have kushanti. They are patient, disciplined, and gentle. Even if they were ridiculed, intimidated, or attacked with weapons by all beings, they would endure and not be overcome by greed, anger, and delusion. Noble one, the world is named Saha, enduring, after those sublime beings. Even when evil people lie about the blessed Tathagata Shakyamuni, that blessed one remains compassionately patient and accepting. The same applies to those who are filled with hate and rage, who are sinking into the hell realms, who make the lower realms their domain, and who fail to respect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, as well as all the degenerate beings who delight in jealousy and who ridicule and slander the Blessed One, doing him harm by insulting him. With a mind that is broad like the earth, Shakyamuni is without attachment and anger. Thus, even when people honor him, he does not become self-important. And if they fail to honor him, doesn't bother him either. Even if people ridicule and scold him, he does not think about it or conceptualize it, and he remains unfazed. He does not become disturbed, agitated, or saddened by it. Therefore, that world is called Saha, enduring. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva, king of the mound of stars adorned with characteristics, remarked to the Tathagata, king of all shala trees, world honored one, I am very fortunate that I was not born among such degenerate beings in that world. The world honored one replied, noble one, you must not say that. Why? In the northeastern direction from here, there is a world called a thousandfold adornments. In that Buddha realm, the Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambuddha, King Maheshvara, is still present, alive and well. The beings in that Buddha realm are extremely happy. The happiness of those beings, it's equivalent to the bliss experienced by a meditator absorbed in nirvana. Noble one, compared to spending billions of years practicing pure conduct in that world, thousandfold adornments, you would generate far greater merit by arousing for just an instant, a loving attitude for all the beings in the Saha world. That being so, what need we say of those living purely day by day within it? The Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, king of the mound of stars adorned with characteristics, then declared to the blessed Tathagata, king of all shala trees. World honored one, I'm going to the Saha world to behold and venerate and honor the blessed Tathagata, Arahat Samyak Sambuddha Shakyamuni, and to see the gathering of bodhisattvas and hear the Dharma. The world honored one said, noble one, if you know the moment is ripe, then go. And with a single thought, the Bodhisattva king of the mound of stars adorned with all characteristics, surrounded by a hundred million Bodhisattvas, disappeared from that Buddha realm and arrived in the Saha world. The Bodhisattva king of the mound of stars adorned with characteristics then wondered, 
what kind of miracle shall I perform to go before the blessed Tathagata Shakyamuni? That Bodhisattva then performed a miracle such that the great 3000 world system was covered by a single jeweled parasol from which a rain of various flowers fell and hundreds of thousands of instruments resounded. From the parasol dangled hundreds of thousands of pearl garlands, hundreds of thousands of parasols and banners and standards waved high. Moreover, all of the monks and the nuns and laymen and laywomen and gods and nagas and yakshas, gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kinaras, maharagas, humans and non-human beings gathered in the blessed Shakyamuni's assembly. They now all perceived their own bodies adorned with the 32 auspicious marks of great beings. Such was the miracle that Bodhisattva performed. Once the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, king of the mound of stars adorned with char characteristics, displayed this miracle, he and all the other Bodhisattvas went before the blessed Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambhutta Shakyamuni. Arriving there, they bowed their heads at the feet of the blessed one, circumambulated him three times, and sat to one side on seats of lotus flowers that appeared in accordance with their aspirations. In the same way, immeasurably many countless bodhisattvas, those great beings, in immeasurably many countless trillions of worlds throughout the 10 directions, also witnessed the great burst of illumination and heard the clear voice, whereupon they also inquired to their respective Tathagatas about it, and all arriving in the Saha world, they bowed their heads at the feet of the blessed Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambuddha Shakyamuni, sat, circumambulated him three times, and sat to one side. All the gods, the Nagas, the Yakshas, Gandharavas, Asuras, Garudas, Kinaras, and Maharagas in this 3,000 great thousand world system, as well as Chakra Devanam Indra, Brahma, the four great heavenly kings who protect the world, and all other splendorous gods likewise witnessed the great burst of illumination and heard the clear voice. They also went before the blessed Tathagata Shakyamuni. Arriving there, they all bowed their heads at the feet of the blessed one, circumambulated him three times, and sat to one side. At this point, the world honored one, the Buddha, performed a miracle such that all the immeasurably many countless bodhisattvas gathered from immeasurably many countless trillions of worlds throughout the 10 directions, all perceived the arrays of virtues of their own Buddha realms identically present in this Saha world with nothing missing whatsoever. Then, in the perception of all the bodhisattvas, the body of the Tathagata Shakyamuni became the exact shape and size as the Buddha of their Buddha land. Each bodhisattva also perceived the abundance of bodhisattvas, the abundance of great voice hearers, and all of the riches and enjoyments of their respective Buddha lands to be present here so that they each had the sense that they were actually in their own Buddha realm. Such was the miracle the Buddha performed. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Are you feeling okay? 
Everybody excited to be in the Saha world now? So I hope you picked up on that, of course, that idea that we saw last week that there's, I'm, I'm beginning to feel like this is my favorite Pure Land Sutra because it's really kind of making clear this idea of what a Pure Land is in that way. And what I mean is, is you know, I did all this talking tonight about relativity and that idea. And it's kind of about that reframing of one's experience, frankly, right? So hope you all liked that. There's just one little poem that I probably should read because that'll bring us right to the end of this section. But I just wanted to make sure to address any questions or ideas. Cool. So this is just um, when, when the Bodhisattva, oh, actually, yeah, this is a little bit of a new, new piece of information. So when the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya saw the vast Bodhisattva assembly, he rose, draped his shawl over one shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, and with his palms joined together, bowed toward the world honored one, and spoke in verse. Renowned in all directions, your mind is boundless, and the world and its gods appear vividly before you. All beings together could not fathom your mind. O Muni Sage, thus you are inconceivable. A limitless number of bodhisattvas have arrived here today from throughout the ten directions, all seeking the Dharma. They are all seated here in reverence before the Blessed One, Supreme Speaker. Teach them the Dharma. Your speech resounds in all ten directions without exception. With a mind of discipline, diligence, and meditative absorption, you are as fearless as a lion. You are as beautiful as the sun shining in the sky. Gods, Nagas, Asuras, Ganyukas, male and female, lay practitioners, monks and nuns alike, are all seated here with palms joined respectfully. O oh, blessed one, who desires their benefit, please teach us the Dharma. You know the past and the future, and you also know the present with total certainty. You see the inclinations of embodied beings. So please teach the Dharma that dispels all doubt. O oh, sage, how must bodhisattvas practice to obtain pure and immaculate Buddha lands? How do they achieve the fulfillment of their aspiration? O oh, guide, please teach us these things immediately. How can, how can we be unstained by stinginess? How can our discipline not degenerate? How can we tolerate intimidation and slander and disparagement? Oh, sage, how should the heirs of the Buddhas practice diligence throughout many millions of kalpas in order to relieve the suffering of the world, afflicted as it is with myriad ills, how can we remain unstained by desire, always single-pointed, composed, concentrated, our domain pure, like the lotus, unstained by the muddy water? O oh, sage, how can we preach the profound dharma and become so learned that we transcend the world. Stable one, how can we defeat Mara and his hordes and reach the stainless and unsurpassed awakening? Okay. That's, I'll pause there. Okay. So just to clarify and summarize, 
The theme tonight has been the family of the Buddhas and sort of what it means to be sort of born into the family of the Buddhas. And the idea, of course, that I've been trying to get across is that that's what a bodhisattva is. A bodhisattva is a child of the Buddha. They have this great term. The term is a Buddha putra. So putra means child. And then a Buddha putra is a child of the Buddha. I know that in the Tibetan, the what I've been reading is from the Tibetan and they translate a certain term. It's, it's where the Buddha says to the, uh, the Bodhisattva, uh, noble one or noble son. I'm, I understand in, in the Tibetan why they would translate it as noble, as Arya. It's about the, the language of Arya. But the idea is, is that in the Chinese, what the Buddha usually refers to the bodhisattvas as is not worthy one or, or honored one or noble one in that way. The Buddha is always referring to them as Buddha Putra. Oh, child, child of the Buddha or children of the Buddha. And so, yeah, tonight I just kind of wanted to make it clear kind of what that means. And I guess I did mention it and I have a couple of minutes to spare. So about the Vajrayana, I mentioned at the beginning that this way of thinking, which is to say like the family of the Buddhas and sort of being reborn kind of in the family of the Buddhas, that's a very, that idea, which we have here in its very classic Mahayana form. But that idea becomes a much more developed idea in Vajrayana. And, you know, one, I guess there's a lot of things I could talk about, and I probably should choose them carefully. But the basic idea that, yeah, I guess I just want to summarize it as this, and this is actually an important point I didn't mention and I meant to. So the idea of being a mammal, the idea of considering oneself a human, a mammal in that way, and in particular, it doesn't even actually matter what kind of creature in that sense but the idea is is that to under understand oneself as having been born so the thing about it is is that there's a, a an aspect of that construction of the identity of self is the idea of of having been born and then, of course, that goes to, or well, it can go then to this relationship to one's mother as one's um, birther I, in that sense. So the thing about that, and we, I've talked about this a lot, so I just want to kind of make this quick, but in the realm of all of these characteristics I've been talking about. In the realm of characteristics like being tall or being short or being this or being that, there's the characteristic of having been born, of being a birth thing. Now, a good Dharma student can take a quick analysis and understand very clearly that this is not what came out of my mother's womb. This could not fit, <laughs> frankly. My point is, is that when we ident identify with the birth, with that which was born, and we do this when we celebrate our birthday, we do this with 
the idea of how old we are. We do this. And what I want to do is sort of, you know, without rehashing the entire Dharma talk tonight, I just want to highlight the characteristic of being born. And what I want to point at is not so much the empty nature of that characteristic, because remember, if it's a characteristic, it's relative, it's conditional. And of course, being born is as relative and conditional as it gets. But in particular, what I'm interested in pointing at is how there's a, how can I put this bluntly, right? There's a way in which we herald our death with every celebration of a birthday. You, you keep reminding yourself, and, and I don't just mean it as a reminder, you keep identifying with the birth. And what you get with that is the other end of that spectrum. And the reason why Buddhism, even in the earliest days, not even Mahayana, but the earliest days, Buddhism was called the teaching of the deathless. And it, what it was about is, is that you avoid death when you don't identify with the birth. But again, we don't do this out of blind ignorance and repression where it's like, like, all right, I'm just going to forget about my parents. I'm just going to forget about my parents. And I'm just going to like try to forget about that. It's not about repressing memories and all of that. It's about actually understanding that this was not the birth. And so you can continue to identify with the infant, but it's not this. And so the real liberation from the perils of death come when you're not identifying with the, the, the body that will die in that way. And there are traditions that are designed to bring you to a more transcendent identity. There are traditions that are very, very well established where they can lead you from identifying with this to identifying with the totality of all things, to identifying with God, and that will change your life. If you no longer identify with the physical body, but identify with, say, God or whatever, but that's still a, an identity. This bodhisattva path of not identifying, it can only be described as a practice. It is an ever unfolding practice of being like, oh, I was identifying with that again. And it was leading to suffering again, darn. And realizing it, oh, I'm doing it again. So again, it's a practice in that way. So that's it. Oh, sorry, Tanya, you did have your hand, please. You know, as you're talking about the birthlessness, um, I thought back to what you were saying about like there not being any um, uh, nurseries, you know, in the, you know, the, the womblessness thing. Um, and I was just wondering, do you think maybe that's also sort of pointing to birthlessness? Because I mean, they just, you know, Tanya's down there. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but um, I did yeah. the thumbs down, but I was pointing at you. It was a thumbs up. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because I was just thinking like, it's another reminder, right? I mean, so they like, they just poof appear on the, on the lotus flowers, but there's, it's wombless. There's no birth. Bingo. I feel, I feel accomplished, Tanya, for, to hear you say that back to me. I'm like, yes, I didn't blow it. I didn't turn this into a gigantic argument because it's risky. And so to hear you say that, it's like, that's what I wanted to get across. So. And then, and then just back to that thing about the womblessness, that's a hard word to say, but it's, I feel like it's a rot, you know, anyway. So one of the things that you said earlier, do you think generally speaking, and again, I imagine, you know, you can't say this across the board, 
but when one sees this in a sutra, like you were saying, where there's no women and it's wombless, it's probably pointing to this sort of birthlessness thing. I think it's absolutely pointing to it. I don't actually okay. see any other reading of it, frankly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. All right, everybody. That's all I've got. I'm going to pass it over to Noam.